coming to you from the headquarters of the John Locke Foundation in Raleigh, North Carolina. So glad you are along with us. Another great panel, another great discussion today. A federal judge, you may know, has now ruled that UNC Chapel Hill did not violate the U.S. Constitution by using racial preferences in its admissions. Now, that decision has once again shined the spotlight on factors that universities use to actually determine their student body, the role of preference and discrimination in that whole calculation, and the challenges to the belief that factors other than merit should be considered. We're going to be talking about this case and many other uh, factors involving admissions in universities today with this distinguished panel. Joining us is Gail Harriet. She is professor of law at the University of San Diego. She is a member of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, and she is co-editor of a fascinating new book of essays. She's also the author of two of those essays in this book. It's called A Dubious Expediency, How Race Preferences Damage Higher Education. Also joining me is a good friend of the Locke Foundation, Jenna Robinson. She is the president of the James G. Martin Center for Academic Renewal. Also along for the discussion is my colleague here at Locke, John Guzay, who is senior fellow in legal studies, and he is an attorney. Everyone, thanks for joining us today. Really appreciate this. It's going to be a fascinating discussion, uh, I know. Professor, let's uh, start with you, if we could. First of all, tell us a little bit about the background for the title of this book of essays, the title, A Dubious Expediency. That wasn't a random choice, was it? No, it wasn't. You know, I get that question a lot. You know, A Dubious Expediency, what's up with that? It's actually a quote. It's from California Supreme Court Justice Stanley Mosk. Way back in 1976, he called race preferential admissions a dubious expediency. Uh, in holding them to be illegal, he said, and I'm quoting him here, to uphold the university uh, would call for a sacrifice of principle for the sake of dubious expediency and would represent um, a, a retreat in the struggle to assure that each man and woman shall be judged on the basis of individual merit alone. Um, a struggle which has only lately achieved success in removing legal barriers to racial equality. So that's Justice Mosk in 1976. And I like that quote. I think it really says it all. Uh, we tend to think of race preferential uh, affirmative action as a left-right issue today. Left of center thinkers favor, right of center thinkers oppose it. Uh, but the most prominent opponents in the early years, uh, and I think the most eloquent, uh, I believe were left of center. Among them was considered a liberal's liberal. You know, maybe more important with, you know, about him was that he'd been a huge supporter of the civil rights movement from way back, back in, back in the 1930s and 40s, notably when it was not yet fashionable to be so. Uh, another example is U.S. Supreme Court Justice William O. Douglas. Back when he was on the Supreme Court, he was often viewed as the furthest to the left of the nine justices. And like Mosk, he had been an early supporter of the civil rights movement and an enemy of Jim Crow. Uh, he was outraged when the rest of the justices chickened out of taking a case. The case was called Defunis versus Odegaard. Uh, it would have been the first Supreme Court case to test the legality of discriminating against white applicants in order to admit more black applicants. He filed a very eloquent dissent. Um, Mosk and Douglas's view of race discrimination, that it's dirty business, um, and that, you know, that regardless of what race is being, being you know, given the short end of the stick, that view of, of race discrimination did not prevail. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court wound up going in a different direction in the Baki case. But I thought it was worth remembering uh, that the most prominent voices against race preferential admissions uh, back then uh, they were individuals who had been strong supporters of the civil rights movement. You know, today, those who call for race neutrality uh, are assumed to be conservatives or libertarians, and it's often true, not always, but it's often true. Uh, but these days, they often get frequently accused of being racist, that race is somehow racist. Uh, go figure. Uh, at any rate, that's where the name of the book comes from. 
Tell us a little bit about the essays and the emphasis of the essays. And again, folks, um, uh, this book is called A Dubious Distinction, How Race Preferences Damage Higher Education. Okay, well, the book contains um, eight essays. Um, and one of the questions that I'm asked maybe most frequently um, is, you know, why did you put together these, these eight, eight essays? You know, why did you think the public needed such a book? Um, and the answer uh, is that my co-editor and I, my co-editor is Myron Sportschild, is one of my, my colleagues here at the University of San Diego. We did it because it seemed to us that the public was hearing nonstop about diversity, equity, uh, and inclusion these days, which all sounds very nice. Uh, in some sense, we're all in favor of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, but you know, what you hear today is only one side of the story. Uh, one thing that needed to be made clear is that colleges that talk about diversity almost exclusively mean racial diversity. Perish the thought that colleges and universities should be concerned about viewpoint diversity today. They aren't, in fact, they fight against it. Uh, more specifically, uh, what they are talking about is lowering admission standards for certain underrepresented racial minorities so that more members of those groups are admitted to highly selective schools. Uh, and they aren't talking about a tiny thumb. <coughs> cases. Uh, the cases are not closed. For example, uh, in the early 2000s at the University of Michigan, uh, an African-American student with straight Bs uh, would be treated the same as a white or Asian student who'd gotten straight A's in high school for the purposes of admission. So straight B's, straight A's, that is not a tiny thumb on the scale in an otherwise close case. That's very serious preferential treatment. Uh, another thing my co-editor and I uh, thought was needed to be clarified uh, was this. You know, it's easy to get the impression today that academics uniformly favor race preferential admissions policies, uh, but that's a misimpression. There are plenty of academics who oppose these policies. Uh, what is true is that academics who oppose race preferential admissions have for decades uh, been intimidated about speaking up. Um, in the last few years, it's gotten much worse. Uh, and you know, as you may have noticed, academics as a group are not a really courageous lot. I really can't explain that, but that does seem to be a fact. Uh, still, you know, in their defense, they aren't imagining that, that there's a risk to their careers for speaking up. Just this month, uh, many of you might have read about Dorian Abbott, a professor of geophysical science at the University of Chicago. Uh, he learned the hazards of speaking up. Uh, as you may have heard, Dr. Abbott was invited to give a prestigious lecture at MIT, and no doubt he was pleased and excited to be extended such an honor. I mean, who wouldn't be? Uh, but then the Twitter mob got started. Uh, Abbott sin. for race neutrality, both in admissions policies and also in faculty hiring. And of course, the topic of his lecture at MIT wasn't about that. It was about, I guess it was about geophysical science, uh, but that didn't matter to, to his opponents. To the identity politics organizations at MIT, Abbott was a heretic, you know? They couldn't tolerate that. They put pressure on the powers that be at MIT uh, and MIT's leadership to its everlasting discredit utterly caved. Uh, they uninvited the guy. He was not welcome at MIT. So no wonder academics are shy about admitting that they oppose race preferential admissions policies. And that's why we thought it was important to put together these eight essays. Um, by the way, just in case you haven't heard, Dr. Abbott's story did have a happy ending. He was canceled at MIT, but the James Madison program at Princeton University's um, tiny island of academic freedom and a sea of, of wokeness that is the, the modern Ivy League, it hosted a substitute lecture via Zoom for Dr. Abbott, and not surprisingly, given all the publicity uh, that the whole situation had gotten, he got a larger audience there than he would have at MIT. So my hope and, and, and the hope of my co-editor uh, was that our anthology would help alert the public that race preferential admissions policies uh, that they are opposed, at least by some academics. Polls back in the 1990s suggested it might even be a majority of academics. Haven't seen the polls since then, but, but you know, it, it's, I at least know it's a lot of academics. And the book is about 
what the reasons are for this. So allow, to allow the Republic to, to evaluate those reasons. So let me tell you a little bit about some of the individual essays in the book. The first one is by UC Santa Cruz literature professor, John Ellis. John used to be Dean at the graduate school at Santa Cruz back in the 1970s. So he's been around. And his essay is in some sense, a short memoir of that experience. Uh, his message is essentially follow the money. Uh, he admits that as Dean, he was doing that himself. I mean, federal money was available uh, for graduate schools that admitted more underrepresented minorities. So Santa Cruz didn't evaluate the pedagogy of all of this. You know, it's, there was money available. As Dean, his job was to raise as much money as possible. The federal government said essentially, would you like some money? And his response was, yes, please. Um, university administrators are judged according to how much money they raise. That's just the reality. So that's what he did. It was only after he started down that road that he realized that they were not doing either the university or the minority students a, a good turn. Um, by then, it was very difficult to turn back. Very candid essay, and I highly recommend it. The second essay in the book is by yours truly. Um, it makes what I consider to be the ultimate argument against race preferential admissions. Uh, they don't work. They just don't work. We now have quite a bit of empirical evidence that African-American students are not being done a favor when they are admitted to a school where their academic credentials uh, put them towards the Never lose sight of the fact that that's exactly what preferential treatment does. It makes it likely that a student who receives the preference will be competing against students who are better prepared and hence more likely to get good grades. Okay, several empirical studies now show that we would have more African-American medical doctors, more African-American dentists, engineers, scientists, if only African-American students attended a college where they didn't need a preference, where their entering academic credentials are no different from other students. You know, to put it differently, affirmative action preferences actually hurt their intended beneficiaries. They don't help. Um, there are also studies showing we would have more African-American lawyers and more African-American college professors. Again, if colleges and universities admitted students in a race neutral manner. Getting into a high prestige college is a great thing, but getting good grades in college is also a great thing. Uh, the best thing, if you can do it, of course, is to have both, you know, to have both the, the highly prestigious school and the high grades. But those two things are intention. Very often you can't have both. And it turns out from this research that if you can't have both, getting good grades is somewhat more important. So the studies you know, that I discuss in this essay show that it's usually better to have good grades at a very good school than to have bad grades at And that's the problem here. Affirmative action makes it more likely that underrepresented minority students will get disappointing grades. No supporter of race preferences who has looked at the data disputes that that's what happens. You know, on average, not always, some people, you know, but on average, the grades are disappointing. And the reason is pretty simple. While some students are going to outperform their entering credentials, just as some students will underperform theirs, most students, on average, perform in the general range that their entering credentials suggest. And it's not just race, uh, any kind of preference um, is likely to cause the student to get disappointing grades, whether that preference is due to race, athletic prowess, or parent political clout. You know, the unfortunate part is, you know, those very same students could have gotten good grades, maybe even excellent grades at a school just a little bit further down in the pecking order. I don't see how anybody could support race preferential admissions policies if it turns out that this research is correct in concluding that it actually makes it more difficult for minority students to succeed. You know, some people have, have gotten excited and said, Gail, you know, that's not the point of diversity admissions. The point is to enrich everybody's education uh, through diversity. But you know, let's remember, minority students aren't public utilities. I can't imagine that anybody would think it's okay 
minority students, of white students, even though the minority students themselves are worse off. Okay, so that's that essay. Speaking of minorities, um, don't forget the situation faced by Asian American students in particular. They are the biggest victims of race discrimination today. Uh, and the book does have an essay about that. It's by Lance Azumi and Rowena Ichan, uh, both of whom are from the Pacific Research Institute. Their essay discusses the fact that Asian students, again, on average, there are always exceptions, do better than other racial groups, very much including white, on um, measures of academic, um, academic uh, performance. That includes high school grades and standardized test scores. And alas, what they've been getting as a result of that is not congratulations, but essentially a penalty. They have to be that much better than students of other races to get admission to the college of their choice. To me, that's utterly outrageous. You know, that's, that's un-American. Uh, and anyone who knows about the history of California knows that Asians faced horrific discrimination in the late 19th century, at least comparable to discrimination in the non-Jim Crow states faced by African-Americans in other parts of the country during that time period. It was very serious and often violent discrimination. Oddly today, Asian-Americans face discrimination in college admissions just as they would have back then. Uh, Lance and Rowena write about that discrimination. Please savvy Asian Americans and what they've tried to do to counter that discrimination, sometimes successfully and sometimes not so successfully. Okay, the rest of the essays, and I don't think I'll have time to talk about them all, but Heather McDonald uh, writes about how university departments that everybody used to think were immune to, to, to political correctness and wokeness, science, math, and engineering, they aren't immune anymore. Um, and some of the, the most startling, um, startling um, ways in which um, wokeness and, 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 and racial discrimination on campuses come out of those departments. My colleague on the Commission on Civil Rights, Peter Kersenow, he writes about how race preferential admissions have encouraged uh, what he calls campus separatism, separate dorms, separate student lounges, separate graduation ceremonies, uh, which has morphed into this concept of safe spaces. Peter Wood, who is president of the National Association of Scholars and an anthropologist, writes about the astonishing versatility of that term diversity um, and the startling incoherence um, of the ideology that surrounds it. Um, Peter Wood is one of the best writers I know, and I think that it's a, it's a very amusing essay. Uh, at any rate, I think that, that I should stop there um, and we should, we should start a conversation here. Terrific. Professor, thank you so much for that summary of the book. And as you can tell, this is a book you are definitely going to want to read. It's called A Dubious Expediency, How Race Preferences Damage Higher Education. And our guest, Professor Gail Harriet, is a co-editor of this book of eight essays. She's the author of two of the essays in the book. So this is really inc incredible. I'd like to welcome back to the conversation uh, our good friends Jenna Robinson and also John Guzay here at the Locke Foundation. You know, what strikes me, um, Jenna, is um, the issue of equity versus equality and the word diversity, and the professor referred to it, and that's what we hear these days, yet in the data that the professor has presented clearly, at least on average, we are hurting the very people that these types of policies are supposed to be helping, and, and yet it is really, really tough to get people to listen to this, to listen to, to the data. It is, and I think that that's because the, re, the way they're looking at equity is simply, it's an exercise in bean counting. Do we have enough students of you know, the various ethnic minorities at each institution. And if it isn't, if it doesn't match with their population percentage, then they see that they're they're not, it's not equitable. That's that's the definition. It's it's very simple. It doesn't look at the outcomes, it doesn't look at the fact that fewer students of color are graduating or taking STEM majors or becoming leaders in their universities. Um, for the most part, they're just looking at enrollment. How many students are we getting through the door 
who checked the various boxes. And as Gail said, that's in the long run, very damaging to the very students it is trying to help. Yeah, John, what a shame that is when, when people are considered really cogs, cogs in a wheel, uh, numbers on a sheet of paper, when it seems like the whole, at least the, the um, aspirational idea of a university is to see the individ individual and to develop that individual, and yet people become numbers on a page. Well, that's right, Donna. I, I just want to put in my two cents and say this is, I can't see myself, but I hope you all can see this is a wonderful book. Anybody who cares about higher education in America ought to read it. It's full of surprising, eye-opening data, and, and, and it's also full of fascinating history of how affirmative action took hold and what the effects have been. So I can't recommend it highly enough. If I may, I'd like to start by asking Professor Harriet a question. Um, I'm a Harvard graduate myself, and I've been following a case called Students for Fair Admissions at Harvard with interest because, uh, well, it's my alma mater, but also because it's, a, it's one of these instances where it's about, it's brought by Asian Americans who have been grossly discriminated against at Harvard for decades. I'm wondering, um, Professor, whether do you think it's, 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 it's they've, they've applied to the Supreme Court, and uh, I'm wondering whether you think the court's going to take the case. That's an interesting question. You know, I, I am actually pretty optimistic about this. Uh, the court took the unusual step of, of instead of deciding back in the spring, well, they easily could have said, said yes. I mean, they easily could have said no. They didn't say no. Instead, they asked um, the Biden administration, in particular, the Solicitor General, um, for, for the official Biden administration's view uh, of the case. And you know they know what the Biden administration's view of the case is. I mean that 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 sounded like like a stalling mechanism to me. And I think what's going on, you know, we will find out soon whether I'm right on this. Uh, but I think what's going on is they they were stalling. They knew they already had a pretty controversial docket uh, for the upcoming uh, the upcoming session, and they sort of thought, well, can can we stall? Can we put this off? You know, let's ask for for the Solicitor General's opinion for the Biden administration. Because if they weren't going to take the case, they could have just not taken the case. So I would say the odds of them taking it now, once they hear from the Solicitor General, uh, the odds of them taking it are a little better than even. So, you know, I'm optimistic and I'm optimistic that once they decide the case, um, that maybe, just maybe, um, they will start what is probably going to be the long process of moving higher education away from these race preferences. Um, it's not gonna happen in one, one decision of the Supreme Court. It's not gonna be, boom, this is over. Um, but maybe we're gonna start moving in that direction. Um, I, should, I should warn you, however, I've said that before and it didn't happen. <laughs> well, of course, here in North Carolina, a, a lot of focus recently shined on this whole issue because of this case out of UNC Chapel Hill with the federal judge now ruling that, as I said at the beginning of our program, that UNC Chapel Hill did not discriminate, did not violate the Constitution uh, when they are uh, using racial preferences in admissions. And Jenna, you follow the UNC system very closely. Uh, tell us a little bit um, about this suit and if you were surprised at what the federal judge ruled here. Well, I think that we shouldn't be surprised. The, if we look at the judge and her past rulings, she's an Obama appointee. Um, and her past rulings indicated that this is the way that the case was going to turn out. And this is U.S. Um, District Judge Loretta Bids. Absolutely. Um, the, and the decision was highly deferential to UNC. And I think that, frankly, the evidence that UNC produced to say that there are educational benefits at UNC because of the student body diversity uh, is the weakest evidence. Um, one of the pieces of evidence, I'm putting it in quotes, um, that she quoted was that uh, th this is from a quote from a white alumna of UNC who served as student body president. She said that learning in a diverse student body prepared her to work with coach and teach others who do not look like her or had not had the same experiences. 
And so the evidence that UNC cited were just quotes from students who said they liked diversity at their school and it that benefited them. Um, but I think that it's laughable that this is UNC's evidence uh, for the benefits to the student body of diversity, because you know, as as Gail has pointed out, that's not that's not what the evidence says, and that's not really how evidence should work coming out of a university that you know pretends to to teach about how um, how to actually you know use the scientific method to prove your point. Exactly. I mean, UNC Chapel Hill certainly has the reputation, not only in this state, but across the country as um, one of those sought after campuses and that is very difficult to get into that um, you have high school students who will be taking AP classes and, you know, uh, brushing up on trying to write the essays and all that kind of thing in order to try to compete because it's such a rigorous uh, process. It just seems like those two things don't fit together. Yeah, they're, they presented anecdotes as their evidence, really, in this case. And I think it is it is sad, but it's also, I think, an indictment of the court that accepted this and quoted this um, to show that it was a political decision. Yeah, interesting that uh, Professor Harriet was saying that there are plenty of academics who oppose this kind of thing, but they're intimidated by this. And certainly, you'd have to be living in a cave for the last several years to not have read or heard of the plentiful examples, unfortunately, of academics who are, as we call it today, canceled because they uh, have a point of view on something that, that is not considered to be politically correct for that campus. How is it, it possible that we've gotten to that point uh, when, at least when I was in college, granted that wasn't exactly recently, but it was all about the marketplace of ideas, and you had far left all the way across to far right, and it was really engaging in the classroom to hear from people who I had never, some of the ideas I had never even heard of in my life. I found out later I must have grown up quite sheltered, but um, that was what it was all about, and you were bouncing ideas off of one another all the time, and it really was learning that not everybody thinks the same. That seems to have really gone kind of, you know, been kicked to the curb. And, and I don't understand that, particularly from the academics who are there. I thought that was why they were there. I thought so too. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's true um, that on campus today, it is very hard to express um, a viewpoint that is not the, the official, politically correct, uh, even woke viewpoint. And, you know, to some extent, I think race preferential admissions are part of the roots of that. Um, that, you know, you had a population of students on campuses uh, who felt like they owed their, their, their presence on campus um, to race preferential admissions. And as I've said, you know, on average, they weren't doing as well as other students. And it tends to create sensitivities. Um, and everybody on campus that I've ever met desperately wants all students to succeed very much including underrepresented minority students. Uh, I think, you know, the community got overly sensitized. Um, and as a result, we got the rise of, of political correctness um, beginning, you know, in the late 1980s. Uh, and then something else happened, I think, that added an extra layer um, of, of um, sensitivity on the part of, of, of university uh, administrators. And that is, when the Civil Rights Act of 1991 passed for the first time, it made money damages available um, for harassment cases, both sexual and racial. Um, and that, that was initially just for Title VII, for employment law, but the Supreme Court extended it to Title VI, which covers students you know, at a, a university that receives federal funding. And there was this fear that, that you know, something that is insensitive might actually give rise to a harassment lawsuit, which might actually, you know, cost the school money. So they bring in all the people to teach you, you know, don't say insensitive things. Um, and everybody who wants to be, you know, especially virtuous here, you know, their standards of what you're allowed to say uh, just rises and rises till we get to the point where we are now. Um, and it's not that, that university administrators are constantly thinking we might be sued, we might be sued. 
But there's this dynamic created by the notion that a racial harassment lawsuit or a sexual harassment lawsuit, either one could lead to, to, to lawsuits. And that just sort of increased the likelihood um, that people would become hypersensitive um, people who are left of center to want to say that anyone who disagrees with them on a policy issue um, is in fact racist and sexist. Um, so it's been a bad formula. You know, we hear the phrase, um, John, affirmative action. We also hear the phrase racial preference. Is there a difference between the two? Honestly, that's a technical question. I, I, I have to defer to Gail, but instead of answering and attempting to get it wrong, I'd like to direct a couple more questions back her way and then on top of that one. And, and I wanna bring, just before we leave them, the Harvard case and the UNC case, if one of these cases gets to the Supreme Court professor and if the, if the court basically strikes down racial preferences as it ought, uh, what do you think that will mean for the whole diversity, equity and inclusion bureaucrat, bureaucracy and what will it mean more generally? Conversely, if the court refuses to take the cases or decides the wrong way, is there any other alternative approach we could be taking to reining in race preferential admissions policies? Okay, if we assume a blockbuster decision from the Supreme Court, uh, the bureaucracy will survive. Bureaucracies always survive um, Supreme Court decisions. They can't like find it unconstitutional to have such a bureaucracy. So, you know, remember with Brown versus the Board of Education, that was a very strong decision, but it took more than a decade to actually get the job done. Um, and it will take a long time to wean colleges and universities um, from, from uh, race preferential admissions. There will have to be um, things in place that deny funding uh, to universities that engage in preferences. It'll take a while. And on the other side of the ledger, if you get a, 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 a terrible opinion or if the court um, doesn't take the case at all. It is interesting to look at what's happening in some states, in particular uh, now 20, 25 years ago now in California, um, we passed what was called Proposition 209 uh, that amended the state constitution uh, to state, uh, the state shall not discriminate against or grant preferential treatment to any individual or group on the basis of race, color, ethnicity, um, sex, or national origin in the operation of public employment, public education, and public contracting. That was added to the Constitution. I co-chaired that, that, um, that campaign back in 1996. Um, I was 12 years old at the time. Um, <laughs> uh, but it, it, it helped here. It helped um, here. No, I wasn't 12 years old at the time. That's a lie. Uh, but it, it helped in California. In fact, uh, Duke University economist Peter Arcidiacono did a study of how that affected the University of California. Um, and it had happened just the way the research said it would happen. When you get rid of that gap in credentials, um, and that's what happened, um, that meant that grade point averages in college for African American students shot up. Uh, the successfully graduated with a degree in STEM shot up and graduation rates generally shot up. In fact, graduation rates were creeping up for every group at that point, but they, they crept up especially uh, for students who were underrepresented minorities and Professor Arcidiacono concluded that a, a, a significant hunk of the increase uh, in graduation rates was directly attributable to Prop 209. And what I'm hoping uh, is that even if the Supreme Court is not willing to, 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 to get into this fight at all, um, the more states that adopt policies like that, whether they do it through popular initiative uh, or do it through, through an action of uh, the board of trustees that governs each university or do it through the state legislature, you know, I'm hoping more states will move in that direction. Always remembering that even if you don't get complete success, you know, anything that can be done to decrease that credentials gap is going to decrease that mismatch effect and will be better uh, for minority students and I think ultimately better for everybody. So that is something that can be done. And I know the North Carolina legislature 
uh, has considered this and I hope they give it all the, the consideration it should get. Uh, and I hope other states as well. We've already got Washington State, um, let's see, uh, Nebraska, Oklahoma, Arizona. Uh, and it's always true that the university fights it. They try to come up with ways around it, but they can never quite get all the way around it. And so last year, the California legislature, which is absolutely deep blue, I mean, that there's dominated by Democrat, it is dominated by extreme left Democrats. They tried to repeal Prop 209 um, and they had to put it to a vote of the people. And everybody told us like, we don't have a chance. We put together the old campaign and brought in some new faces. We had lots of volunteers, but we didn't have a nickel for our <laughs> the Donors all thought we were gonna lose. They thought, you know, no chance. You're not gonna be able to prevent the repeal of Prop 209. But miracle of miracles, despite being outspent by about 16 to one, uh, we killed them at the polls. Even in deep blue California, voters believe in race neutrality. They believe that no, no racial group should be discriminated against. And they knew that here in California, Asian Americans were getting hit particularly hard. Um, and, you know, I'm proud of California for that. Uh, they were unable to to uh, repeal Prop 209. And I hope instead the story of Prop 209 in one form or another spreads to more states. Well, Jenna, regarding uh, the UNC case, I mean, I know you have a, a lot of um, contacts, uh, some on the record, some off the record over in the UNC system. I mean, is there an, a, a reaction to this federal ruling that is unhappy with the ruling or is everybody just pretty much falling on, in line with well well yeah you know we we need to be using race uh, as as part of our process i don't think anyone is considering this decision as final and so there's very much just a wait and see approach at unc chapel hill uh, they they know it's going to be appealed they know it will uh, either be turned down or accepted by the supreme court and at that point i think they'll decide how they're going to react to it but right now it's just, well, it's a lower court, we'll wait. Um, there are some people at UNC who think, you know, why, why there are a few people, I'll say a few people at UNC think, you know, why wait, we can, we can stop using preferences on our own right now. But I think that the overall opinion at UNC is that they're just gonna wait. You know, John, I was um, looking back to, um, the uh, quote from the late Supreme Court Justice uh, Sandra Day O'Connor from my home state of Arizona, in which she wrote in um, one of the um, deciding cases, I think Grutter versus uh, Bollinger, I think was the case. The court expects that 25 years from now, the use of racial preferences will no longer be necessary to further the interest approved today. That was a case about the University of, of Michigan. Uh, and so, it, at least my read as a non-attorney is that that Justice O'Connor was was thinking there would be an end to all of this. Well, that's right. And and one of the things it shows is that she agreed that this was at best a dubious expediency. If she thought this was an outright good, there would be no point in saying it ought to end at some point. But I. Uh, and I, I guess a lot of people were like her. They they thought we don't we don't like the idea of discriminating against people on the basis of their race, but we're going to do it for a while to make up for past harms. We're a long way. We've we've come a long way in terms uh, chronologically since she made that statement. We ought to be getting close, but the way things are looking on a lot of campuses, from my perspective, is that we're getting further and further away. Race is becoming a more important factor all the time, and it's not just preferential admissions. We've got separate. Uh, living quarters. There's a chapter in the book, by the way, about that. Uh, So-called affinity groups, where they, where it's felt now that it's better for ethnic and racial groups to spend all their time with other members of their same group, not just where, where they sleep, but where they socialize, where they eat. It's kind of an extraordinary turnabout. I have no idea where it's going to end, and it it doesn't look as if that prediction's coming true. I want to apologize to you, Don. I, I diverted the question you had asked about uh, affirmative action versus race preferences. Right. I think maybe the professor could answer that for us before we move oh, on. Yes, I should answer that because the, you know the term affirmative action is much broader uh, than race preferences. If you look back in history, um, the first person that I know of to use that term affirmative action in the context of, of, of race was actually President John Kennedy. 
um, in Executive Order 10925, I think is the number. And when he used that term affirmative action, he was talking about companies that receive federal contracts, this was before the 1964 Civil Rights Act, that they needed to, to affirmatively make sure that their employees are not discriminating. So that they need to make, make it very clear uh, that federal contractors are not allowed to discriminate on the basis of race. And then it wouldn't be an excuse for the federal contractor to say, well, you know, one of our low level employees um, realized that he wasn't allowed to do that. You had to train your employees and make sure that they, they, they did understand what the law is and make sure that they didn't discriminate. And as time went on, for instance, President Johnson um, in Executive Order 11246 also uses that term affirmative action. And he seems to have already expanded it a little bit at that point to include you know, outreach, making sure that people know about the opportunities that are available to them and that they are assured that they won't be discriminated against. But over time, that term affirmative action has been used uh, to refer to actual preferential treatment. Uh, and that's why I don't like to use that term affirmative action, at least not, you know, without making it clear in context what kind of affirmative action I'm using. Uh, because, you know, it's a term that it sounds nice, doesn't it? Affirmative action? Yeah, we're all in favor of affirmative action. Um, and we are certainly in favor of making sure that, you know, everyone is aware of what the law is and what is expected of them, that we are in favor of making sure that people are aware of the opportunities uh, that are available to them. All of that is obviously good. Uh, but when it comes to actually discriminating on the basis of race in favor of underrepresented minority students, well, that's, you know, that's where I get off the bus. Um, and that's where I think we're making a mistake. Discrimination in favor of one group is always discrimination against another group. Um, in this that's case, uh, again, the, the, the two racial groups that, that bear the brunt of this, Asian Americans. Uh, I've often wondered what Justice Lewis Powell, uh, who had the deciding opinion um, in the Baki case, which first opened the door to all of this, um, you know, what would he think if he knew how this, how the story has turned out with Asian Americans bearing the brunt of it? Um, but, you know, that's where we are. Jenna, I think it's really interesting, the difference between affirmative action and racial preference. I do see a difference. To me, racial preference is really a shortcut. Take, for example, at UNC Chapel Hill, I mean, in, in, in terms of the athletics and, and sports programs, they have people there whose job is to reach all the way down into high schools and figure out where the potential talent is and to stay in touch and develop that talent, et cetera. They cast the wide net. Why isn't there a parallel action from universities to cast the wide net for um, academic potential? It seems to me that it would be the same benefit, and it is possible to do it rather than just shortcut and just uh, give someone a thumb on the scale based on a, uh, the factor of race. Well, Donna, they, they do that. They absolutely do outreach. They go to schools in inner cities. Um, they, they do, I mean, not as much as athletics, obviously, because there's no money in it or less money in it. But they do outreach, and that's something that I've heard quite a bit about the, the, the different ways in which they do it at UNC and elsewhere. I think that the underlying problem is that everyone is doing it, and there are too few qualified minority students, and every university virtually is engaging in race preferences. And so even if you do wonderful outreach, the pool is too small to satisfy uh, universities demands for minority students. And so I, like you said, I'm, I'm very much in favor of doing that outreach. If there are qualified students who would be a good fit for UNC, we should make sure they know. But, so, then, so then part of the answer to this, then we're reaching down into the K-12 system mm -hmm. and have to address problems there. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Fixing K-12, I think would go a long way to, um, ameliorating a lot of the problems in higher ed. Pretty interesting. So um, how do we actually ensure then that more people are qualified? Because John, that does take us to the K-12 system. 
but it just seems like, again, I think it's easier just to shortcut it and say, go ahead and apply, and then we'll assign some sort of, as I would call it, thumb on the scale, extra points or, or whatever, but it, it, it just seems like such a shame. It's a terrible shame, and the state of our K-12 schools is a terrible shame. I'm not the person to ask what to do about it. You, as you know, we've got people here who are experts in this area, but <clears throat> it's getting worse instead of better, and it's it's a terrible shame. I, I don't, I've got some thoughts. I don't think more money is gonna help. Uh, I think what's gonna help are better conditions in society. And um, I've got thoughts about that too. I think it has to do with, for instance, reducing levels of crime, um, getting rid of the impediments to family formation, but I guess that's too far afield. Uh, well, one I'll thing chime in and say what won't work, and it's something that's being tried right now, is to get rid of test scores. Because obviously the, uh, the, the idea is, well, if we don't measure it, it's not a problem anymore, right? That's, that's the current solution that's being floated. And I wanna be the first one on the record to say that that is not the solution. Uh, that's papering over a problem and, you know, whatever the solution adopted by K-12, whatever solution they go with, they should not uh, copy the universities who have decided that they'll just, you know, stop using uh, standardized tests when they don't show what they want them to show. Yep. You know, another thing that won't work uh, is critical race theory at the K-12 level. Um, and like much to my astonishment, that seems to be what's happening. Although I, I, I'm very pleased with the parents and the grassroots movement to, to, to stop this. The way you improve African-American uh, scholastic achievement is not to teach them that they are losers, that they have been, you know, they are victimized at every turn and they have no possible uh, chance of being successful uh, because there are white supremacists underneath every bed. Um, that, is, that is teaching students that they can't win uh, and they can win, they can. Um, and you know, this is something that can be done, but we're certainly not gonna be successful. Uh, that the life is all about black versus white um, and that white oppressors have made it impossible uh, for, for young black students um, to, to do well in life. Uh, that is certainly not true. Professor, we have an interesting question. I think you touched on the answer in your initial remarks about uh, the comparison from uh, the number of, for example, um, minority doctors that universities pr are producing versus if those, uh, if, if those people had gone to a very good university rather than a number one uh, university. Here's this question from Ken. Has there ever been a study to show the impact of racial preferences on academic achievement? There should be extensive data on that by now. Talk a little bit more about that connection, if you would. Yeah, this is what we call the mismatch data. Um, and there's a lot of research, um, especially in the area of science and engineering. Um, I can think of three studies right off the top of my head. Um, that all found that we would have more African-American scientists, doctors, um, dentists, anything that's related to STEM, engineers, um, if they attended a school where their um, entry credentials put them in the ballpark, um, or with STEM, it's even better to be, you know, towards the top of the class that you're competing against, um, than if they had preferences and hence are at a school where they're competing with people that on average have better academic credentials from, from their high school days. Um, and you know, that's extremely important. These preferences do just the opposite of what, what was being hoped in the area of STEM. Um, there are also a couple of studies uh, conducted by, by um, Professor Rick Sander who is a law professor and sociologist at UCLA with regard to law schools. Um, and these studies, I think I, two of them I can think of by him, uh, show the same thing, that we would have more African-American lawyers um, if they went to a law school uh, that was where their entering credentials were in the ballpark. Uh, one interesting thing about the Sanders studies, um, he admits that those are imperfect studies and it would be better to have more studies. And, he naively perhaps assumed that other people would agree that this was something worth studying. 
So he tried to get data from the state of California, from the California bar, um, because you know the data would be very rich within the, 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 um, the database that they have. And to his surprise, um, they wouldn't give him the data. Um, and he brought a lawsuit because there are ways in which you know, the, the state is required uh, to give, give data. Um, and you know, to me, that speaks volumes that everybody who was in favor of race preferential admissions wanted to prevent Dr. Sander from getting the data that would allow him to do the ultimate study. Um, and so I believe he continues to believe, he's got further studies since then that, that verify what his first studies show. Um, but the best database that would have been available to him, the best one that's available for, to anybody, was denied to him. Um, and as I said, also studies going back actually to all the way to the 1960s, uh, not on race preferences, but on legacy preferences, showing the same thing, um, that it's not good to have gotten into a school based on something other than your academic credentials, uh, that students in that position tend to achieve less rather than more. Um, there are studies, uh, there's one study about college professors in general showing that, that African-American students who get a preference and go to a school where their grades turn out to be disappointing are less likely to want to go to graduate school and to want to become a college professor. Um, and that was a study that was funded uh, by, I believe, the Mellon Foundation, and they absolutely went bananas. They, 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 they basically disowned it uh, because it didn't come out the way they thought it should. Um, and, you know, that again speaks volumes. Uh, there is a very, very strong uh, group of, of individuals and institutions in this country who don't want to see data that show that race preferential admissions have been um, a mistake. They don't want to see it. Uh, too many people have dedicated their lives, you know, and, and in fairness, thinking that they're doing a good thing. And these are important people, Ivy League presidents, uh, and they don't want to say, whoops, it was a mistake. You know, our, our life was devoted to something that turned out to be a mistake. But that's what, you know, most of the studies show. It was a mistake. Um, there are a couple of studies, I should, you know, in full disclosure, there was one study I know of that studied some schools in Missouri and didn't find a mismatch effect. They were not that hierarchical, and so they weren't likely to show uh, the effect uh, in the same way. Um, um, Jenna, most of the studies that I'm aware of do show it. Jenna, we've been talking about UNC Chapel Hill, the flagship, because of this uh, federal court ruling that has come down. But you study the entire UNC system. Is this prevalent? in all of the institutions in the UNC system using race as some sort of a factor in their admissions, or does it vary? The UNC system in general does use race as a factor. It's not, um, some schools use it as very important. In fact, all schools answer this question and you can find the answer to how they use race in admissions. Uh, most, many schools in the UNC system do use race in admissions, but our schools at the kind of the bottom half academically in the UNC system have very low admission standards across the board. And at those schools, I, I think you would find it's, it's unlikely to matter nearly as much as UNC Chapel Hill, NC State, um, Wilmington, um, and Asheville, which do have higher um, admission standards and higher gen higher average SAT scores. So the more selective the school, the more those preferences matter. The professor had mentioned the issue of legacy admissions, a recent story that Amherst College has decided to end legacy admissions. Is that also prevalent in universities? Is that a question for me? Yeah, sure. Okay, legacy preferences are prevalent in universities. I don't know ex the exact extent to which they are used in the UNC system, so I can't comment on that. Professor, do you uh, know about legacy admissions, if that is uh, prevalent as well? I think it's very, very common. Um, I can tell you because of, of the, the litigation over Grutter versus Bollinger and Grotz versus Bollinger, these are the University of Michigan cases before the Supreme Court back in 2003. 
um, the college at the University of Michigan would add 20 points for someone because they are African American to their to their score. Uh, they would add one point uh, for legacy. Uh, so it was very, very, very small preference. But nevertheless, you know, I find it outrageous, especially that a state university would grant any preference based on legacy status. I mean, basically. You know, if your grandparents went to the University of Michigan, that meant that they were better off than the average person. Um, and so this amounts to a preference um, for people who come from families that have been better off uh, or have lived in Michigan for a long time. And you know, that, that's, that's wrong. That should not be the case. Um, and so I know here in California, um, former UC Regent Ward Connerly, who was the chairman of the Prop 209 campaign back when I was co-chair in 1996. He also chaired the, 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 the No on 16, the repeal, uh, the No on Repeal campaign last year when I was again co-chair. Um, and he tried very hard to get the University of California um, to eliminate legacy preferences. Um, and I, I very much supported him in that. Uh, but some of the very same people that, that were in favor of race preferences also supported me, a state university especially, should not be doing that. Um, and even though those preferences are tiny um, at the schools that I'm familiar with, that is the University of Michigan um, and University of California also, they were very small preferences. Um, they're still, they're ugly. They're ugly, I think. Um, you know and I know here at my university, we haven't had a dean who used to think of me as Dr. No, if she had a file from somebody who was like somebody's nephew or somebody's you know, grandchild uh, and she wanted a no, um, she'd send it to me and she'd never say, Gail, I wanna know. But it was obvious, it was obvious that like I, I was the designated no um, and that's what I would do. Now I know professor that you're a member of the US Commission on Civil Rights. I believe one of the um, essays in the book is written by Peter Carsonow, who is also a member of the US Commission on Civil Rights. John Guzet, I believe you're a member of the North Carolina Advisory Council to the US Commission on Civil Rights. John, I'm gonna give you a last thought here. It seems to me that this would be an issue that whether it's a state advisory commission or whether it's the, the Commission on Civil Rights itself would be a hot topic of conversation. John, are you planning to write about this, talk about this? Well, we'll have to see how it goes. I'm a new member um, and I'm not rocking the boat yet. It's, I could tell you already from the interactions I've had with other members of our state committee, most of them wouldn't like that idea one little bit. They think that uh, affirmative action is, or, or race preferences in higher education or anywhere else is actually what civil rights is all about. So we have a disagreement already on what the term civil rights means. If there's time, I'd like to just get back to, we mentioned legacy emissions and Gail pointed out that those constitute a sort of class-based preferential treatment for people who are in the middle or upper classes. Um, some people though think that it's a good idea to not discriminate on the base of race, but discriminate in favor of people who come from, um, a, a, who are from a lower social class or suffer from economic disadvantage. There's a chapter in the book by professors, uh, Professor Harriet's co-editor, co Professor Schwarzschild, and he makes the case that it's just as bad for those people to receive these preferential treatments as it is for African-Americans and people from other ethnic groups. Everybody suffers when they're put in a situation where they're less qualified than their um, classmates. Well, this is a fascinating discussion. Of course, we're going to hear a lot more about this, um, not only in general, but here in North Carolina, because of this uh, federal ruling here from a federal court recently about UNC Chapel Hill, that that university did not uh, engage in discrimination by using racial preferences in admissions. So we'll see what happens if the U.S. Supreme Court takes that case. We've been talking today with Professor Gail Harriet. She is a professor of law at the University of San Diego. She's a member of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. You've got to get this book. John, can I get you to hold up the book? Thank you very much. It's called The Dubious Expediency, How Race Preferences Damage Higher Education. It consists of those eight essays, some of which we've been discussing 
discussing today, two written by our guest, uh, Professor Harriet. Uh, just a fascinating discussion about a um, very serious issue here in our country. Professor, thank you so much. John, thank you. And Jenna Robinson, thank you as well. Really appreciate your time today. Thanks, Donna. Thank you, Donna. And thank you for watching. And as always, we are so appreciative that you have taken the time to watch, to be engaged on such an important issue. That's what we're all about here at the John Locke Foundation, making sure that we educate and inform about the vital issues of our day to make sure that everyone in our state has freedom, has opportunity to pursue what they would like to pursue, to make of their life what they would like it to be. If you like what we're doing, if you believe in our mission, and certainly we hope you do, we would ask you to consider a tax-deductible donation to the work of the John Locke Foundation. We are a nonprofit, so we do rely on you to fuel our work. It's very simple and fast and secure. Just go to johnlock.org. In the upper right-hand corner, there's a Donate tab. Click on that. Safe, secure, less than two minutes, you can make that tax-deductible donation to fuel our work. We would be most appreciative. Hope you'll come back next week for another edition of Shaftesbury Society. I'm Donna Martinez. On behalf of the entire Locke Foundation team, thank you for joining us. Have a great week.